questions towards the end, but I'd like to start off today, like I said, talking about the unique laser lock surface, and then we'll go on to talk about uh, the new BioHorizons tapered pro system and really the, the differences in it compared to our previous tapered implants of BioHorizons and what they will help you achieve in clinical practice as well. So first of all, starting, at with, starting off with the laser lock surface, BioHorizons has had the laser lock surface uh, for, for over 25 years now. We've been researching the surface and using it in clinical practice for over 12 years, going on 13 years now. So it's been a very successful surface for us at BioHorizons and has helped us achieve some unique things in the dental implant space. And that surface is really just applied to the top one to two millimeters of the implant. So it's, it's called laser lock because we use a, a laser ablation method to apply that to the implant surface. And I think to understand the benefits of the laser lock surface, it, it helps to go back and look at how surfaces have developed over time. When we look back at Professor Branamark's design, he used a machine surface uh, or turn surface for the initial implants that really help to make dental implants become popular and encourage more clinicians to place them and, and patients to receive dental implant treatment. And interestingly, that same implant design is still available today, albeit with a slightly modified surface. So it has now a roughened surface to help enhance that osseointegration or speed up osseointegration. But really historically, dental implant surfaces have always focused on osseointegration or hard tissue integration and never really properly addressed the soft tissue element. And we're really in a, a unique world where we have to deal with a transcutaneous implant. There's very few medical devices that are transcutaneous. And it really is a challenge with dental implants to have an implant integrate or attach properly to both hard and soft tissue. And we know when we look at the literature, there's papers and multiple papers that talk about the soft tissue element around dental implants uh, or biologic width, if you like. And this paper by Berglund and Lind from over 20 years ago talked about a certain minimum width that was required around dental implants to help to develop the equivalent of a biologic width around a dental implant. And they find that to take approximately three millimeters of height or space. This paper is nearly 20 years later by Coelho. And the only difference with this paper really in, in analyzing the biologic width or trying to evaluate the biologic width around implants was in this research study, they were using implants that now had a different surface, that being they were roughened implants where they had a, a blasted surface to help enhance osseointegration compared to Berglund and Lynn's study, which used machined implants. So even though this surface had been modified or improved, if you like, they still find a similar dimension of biologic width around those roughened implants. So BioHorizons, we've always taken a different approach. When we talk about our surface, we have the laser lock surface, which has been developed to create a physical connective tissue attachment, unlike other surfaces on the market. It is also ideal for osseo integration as well. So we do refer to it as a dual affinity surface, that being it will integrate with both soft tissue and hard tissue. So it helps to create that connective tissue attachment and maintain crestal bone. And we'll start to look a little bit more of the details of how it does that or why that's beneficial. So typically when you place a dental implant or at least for most dental implant designs, you place them somewhat level with the crest of the bone and during the healing phase or the restoration phase, you will have some kind of bone remodeling as the body adapts or integrates to that implant. And this typically leaves a sulcus and a long epithelial area at the junction of the implant and the abutment. And you compare that to a natural tooth. Obviously the natural tooth has the biologic width with the sulcus, the epithelial attachment, as well as the connective tissue attachment, which traditionally dental implants fail to replicate. They do not have the ability to create that connective tissue attachment. So you end up with this long epithelial area that's really a hemidesmosome type attachment and a, a weak adaptation, if you like, of soft tissue around that implant surface. And when we compare what we find with the laser lock surface, we know from 
many years of studies and multiple published studies and peer reviewed journals that we do create that connective tissue attachment with the laser lock surface. So it really mimics what the biologic width that you would have around a natural tooth uh, on this laser lock surface, because you can develop that sulcus, the epithelial attachment, but also that crucial connective tissue attachment. So you can see in comparison to the randomly roughened or a traditional surface, whether it's blasted or acid etched or whichever variation, it simply does not have the ability to create the connective tissue attachment like the laser lock surface. So why is it effective compared to other surfaces and, and how is it different? Um, as I keep referring to them, like uh, the other surfaces, they're really random in nature. So whether it's blast textured, SLA, acid etched or anodic oxidation, all of those surfaces appear to be random in nature. So there's really no two points that are exactly the same and there's, there's no uniformity in the surface. And when you compare that to the laser lock surface, we refer to it as a more uniform surface. Again, we use a laser to melt the channels, these micro channels into the implant surface. And it creates this uniform series of micro channels, nearly look like railway tracks, if you like. Uh, uh, that are eight microns apart. And it's that size that really gives it the ability to be effective for a connective tissue attachment because it can create contact guidance of cells. A lot of people often compare it to micro threads and micro threads are much larger in scale. You can see here the Astra implant with micro threads, the Nobel implant with micro threads and the BioHorizons implant, which is clearly has a rough surface at the top, but there's actually approximately 75 laser lock microchannels in that area. So much, much smaller in scale compared to microthreads. Again, under higher magnification, you can get a better appreciation for the difference in scale of the microthreads compared to the laser lock microchannels. So in the Astra and Nobel implant, you can see one or two peaks and troughs of the micro threads and you can see multiple micro channels on the laser lock surface. And again, because of that smaller scale, that's what gives it the ability to create a connective tissue attachment uh, in the body. So this paper by Boyne and Swartz really helps to demonstrate how cells react to different surfaces. And here, in this case, we're looking at osteoblasts, but fibroblasts react in a similar way to, to a uh, the roughness of different surfaces. So on a flat surface, because it's less than two microns in height, the cells simply spread out as best they can and try and attach to that surface. So you get less cells coming in contact with that surface because the cells have to spread out more. And that's why we have a lower bone to implant contact on machined or smooth surfaces compared to the newer roughened surfaces on implants. On the micro threads of the typical microthread design, because the threads themselves are so far apart, they're greater than 10 microns apart, the cells cannot span from one peak of a thread to the other and attach. They simply roll in between those threads. On the laser lock microchannels, because they're greater than 10 microns in height, but less than 10 microns apart, the cells can spread from one peak to the other and effectively attach. And when you're dealing with a random surface or a surface that's been blasted or acid etched or the anodic oxidation approach, because you cannot control the topography or the roughness of the surface all across the implant body, you end up with some spots on the surface which are smoother than others and some spot, spots which are roughened. And that's really why they become ineffective for a connective tissue attachment. The cells don't react in a uniform way and therefore this, the body simply reverts to the more easy to achieve hemidesmosome attachment or encapsulation uh, when it comes to the soft tissue. So I, I'm gonna go through a few of the studies that we've published over the years, um, some, of the, some of the more interesting ones, but this is really our landmark study. And it's the first study to prove a connective tissue attachment to a titanium surface of a dental implant. And this was done by Dr. Myron Nevins, a, a periodontist in, in the USA. And really, was he was skeptical of the time of the ability to do this because he referenced the papers like Berglund and Lind that had come before showing that you don't get connective tissue attachment to a dental implant. 
it's more of this hemidesmosome or epithelial adaptation. And uh, to his delight, when he was conducting the study, he did find that not only did the laser lock surface stop that epithelial dying growth or the dying growth of those kind of hemidesmosome cells, but it did show there was a predetermined site for connective tissue attachment, that being the laser lock surface, and ultimately helped to preserve the coronal level of bone. This is one of the interesting studies as well, simply because in this study that was carried out over a two year period, they took a large number of implants comparing both laser lock implants to non laser lock implants to see what the difference would be. So we have laser lock versus the randomly roughened surface or non laser lock implants um, comparing the two groups. And they carried out pretty much every treatment protocol that you would use in clinical practice. So they looked at both immediate placement and delayed placement as well as immediate load and delayed loads. So they went through all four treatment modalities of immediate placement and load, immediate placement and delayed load, delayed placement and immediate load, and delayed placement and delayed load. And on average, the laser lock surface showed half the crest of bone loss compared to the non-laser lock surface. So no matter which treatment modality was adapt, uh, uh, adopted by the clinician, it showed that laser lock could offer superior outcomes. And talking about full arch treatment, which has become increasingly popular with dental implants, uh, this is a, a study that looked at 288 implants in 49 patients over a period of four years, providing the teeth express protocol, as we call it, a biohorizon, or a, a full arch immediate load protocol, and showed really high success rate for that number of patients. So here we have 49 patients with a 97.6% implant success rate for those full arch immediate load restorations. Some of the newer studies that we've been looking at, obviously periimplantitis is an increasing concern within the dental implant industry. And laser lock, as we know, has always been very good at creating a healthy connective tissue attachment. And we wanted to see what the outcome of that would be in relation to periimplantitis. So over the last few years, We've been supporting studies that have been researching periimplantitis and the onset of it for dental implants. And this is interesting, one of the earlier studies looking at laser lock versus non-laser lock surfaces over a one year period in both periodontally healthy, but also periodontally compromised patients. And the summary or the main conclusion or outcome of this study was that there was 70% less periodontal pathogens present in laser lock sites on average. So we showed a greater reduction or a very good reduction of periodontal pathogens on the laser lock implants compared to non laser lock implants. And while the study doesn't exactly discuss the mechanism for this, or the reason for this, we believe because of other papers that have showed reduced probing depths and also the ability to create that physical connective tissue attachment does help to reduce the number of periodontal pathogens. And we know from multiple other studies that an increased number of periodontal pathogens increases the risk of periimplantitis. So it's a, a good sign to show that laser lock implants on average do have less periodontal pathogens. Another study that was conducted um, looking at the actual inducement of periimplantitis on, on the specimens and then trying to see what the uh, outcome would be when recovering or grafting some specimens as well. So in this study uh, conducted by Dr. Hamle Wang, the head of Perio at the University of Michigan, um, they took six mini pigs and placed six implants in each specimen comparing non-laser uh, non lock implants as well as laser lock implants. And they induced periimplantitis on all of the specimens. The specimens were then split into groups one and two. So initially they harvested some of the implants from specimens to see what the bone loss was in comparison to laser lock and non-laser lock. And then they grafted the other group to see how well the graft or how successful grafting would be when comparing laser lock and non-laser lock implants. So after 12 weeks, uh, samples were taken from group one and Group two had the grafting or GBR, GBR therapy to try and overcome the bone loss from periimplantitis. So group one results showed that laser lock implants had less crestal bone loss compared to non-laser lock implants. So laser lock was able to maintain more bone than non-laser lock implants. 
And for group two, the group that was grafted, where they tried to recover after the effect of perimplantitis, they showed that there was better outcomes in terms of more across the bone around laser lock implants compared to non-laser lock. So from the study, it shows or gives some support that laser lock can help reduce the amount of bone loss after the onset of perimplantitis, but also could be more successful when trying to treat it or graft. One of the more exciting studies, a longer term follow-up, this was a, a five-year study following 166 implants in 74 patients. And it showed that 12% of those random surface implants, so those non laser lock implants, had perimplantitis versus only 3.6% of laser lock implants. So for the same time period, laser lock showed a very uh, greatly reduced number of perimplantitis patients. And also interestingly, 29% of the random surface or non laser lock implants had perimplant mucositis versus only 20% of laser lock implants. So encouraging results to show the positive outcomes or positive benefits laser lock can have in terms of possible onset of perimplantitis and reducing the incidence of perimplantitis as well. So for the, so the second half of the presentation, I'd like to, to move on to tapered pro implants and look at the new system that we've launched from BioHorizons and um, why we've done that in terms of new sort of demands in the marketplace. So just a, a little bit of background on, on the global dental implant market. Um, it is forecast to grow at 5% year over year for, for the next five years. Um, so that's all showing very strong growth rate considering other parts um, of the industry. But more interesting, when we look at growth by placement protocol, we see that the immediate type placement protocol is becoming increasingly popular, obviously uh, amongst clinicians, but also for patients as well, who wanna reduce the, their chair time and number of appointments to have their implants placed and restored. Two-stage surgeries forecast to decline about 5% year over year for the next five years, and single-stage surgeries also forecasted to grow. <clears throat> Other drivers supporting this, obviously there's aging population around the world as, on average, um, enhanced designs and simpler protocols can also help to support more immediate placement protocols, but minimal invasiveness and reduced procedures is really what's driving the trend towards immediacy, whether it's amongst clinicians or uh, patients themselves. Of course, there's demand for improved aesthetics that's, that's been growing for a long time within the dental implant industry. It's, it's not the same as it used to be back in the 60s with Professor Brandemark. It's no longer acceptable just to restore function. We have to provide aesthetic outcomes for our patients as well. One of the limitations for a long time for dental implants has been the length of treatment. And ever since uh, dental implants have been developed, it's always been a, a goal to try and reduce that treatment time and provide dental implant restorations in a timely manner for patients, hence why immediate treatments becoming increasingly popular around the world. So when we look at the tapered pro system that we now have with BioHorizons, it really is a system that's designed to offer clinical success in all treatment protocols. So we want it to be successful, whether you want to have a conservative approach of a delayed treatment, uh, delayed surgery and delayed loading, or if the, the case demands a, a more advanced protocol of immediate surgical placement, as well as potentially immediate restoration. So obviously that, that doing that could help to reduce treatment time and appointments. We also want to make sure we maintain the simplicity of our surgical protocol. BioHorizons has always tried to have a simplistic surgical protocol to make surgery efficient for, your, for, for yourselves. And we want to support surgical and restorative needs. So obviously we've talked about immediate placement potential, but also offer a system that supports multiple emergence profiles. So especially when you're, you're dealing with single or maybe short span bridges, we want to be able to support multiple emergence profiles uh, with having a option for different platform sizes. So look at a little bit more detail. One of the main changes you'll see with the tapered pro implant compared to the previous tapered implant designs from BioHorizons is a reduced collar diameter. So the, the top of the implant is no longer the widest part of the implant. And what that helps us achieve is make sure that we no longer need a crestal bone drill or a countersink drill as it's sometimes called. And it helps to eliminate any stress around the cortical bone 
at the crest of the osteotomy. So you no longer have it, any concerns about potential uh, stress or fracturing of the crestal bone around the collar of the implant. It can also be advantageous for placement and extraction sites. When you're placing implants and extraction sites, you wanna make sure that the implant maintains the path of which it's being inserted or it ends up in the location of which you intended. And that can be a challenge when the implant is widest at the top because it can push the implant away from the osteotomy or away from the wall that you're trying to gain engagement in. Of course, this implant maintains the laser lock surface that we've had on tapered implants since 2007. So there's really no change to the surface for this tapered pro implant. And probably the, some of the most advantageous benefits in terms of clinical feel or tactile feedback when you're placing this implant, uh, the combination of the deeper thread design. So the Tapered Pro has a 33% a deeper thread design compared to previous tapered implants, which obviously helps increase surface area, but also gives you the ability for higher primary stability and all to treat more challenging cases and still get good primary stability should you wish to place implants immediately and or load those implants immediately as well. And the helical cutting flute on this is different than previous taper designs. So it's a helical cutting flute, so helical in shape, but it also helps to maintain more threads in the body of the implant. It's not quite as large uh, a void in the cutting flute, so it helps to maintain more threads. It's more effective for self-tapping. So if you're working in sites where you need to under prep and use the implant to self-tap into that site, it's more effective for that. And it does help to increase the surface area as well compared to previous tapered implants. So when you compare tapered pro to a similar tapered internal or tapered plus implant that we have had in the past, it has about 10 to 12% more surface area. So tapered pro implants are available in 3.8, uh, 4.2, 4.6 and 5.2 millimeter diameters from lengths of nine millimeters up to 18, except for the 5.2 which is 15 millimeter is the longest. So 4.2 and 5.2 are new diameters for BioHorizons users. If you have used BioHorizons in the past, you'll know those are our new diameters for us. And uh, 3.8 and 4.6 we've had in the past and continued with this tapered pro family. And we offer three prosthetic platforms in the system. So we have four diameters and three prosthetic platforms to try and simplify the restorative protocol, but also offer uh, various options for emergence profiles, especially in single units. So we always refer to our implants as tapered implants, but in reality, they are a hybrid. So we always have a six millimeter apical taper and anything above that is parallel wall. So that helps to increase the surface area of the implant, but also gives you better ability to get good primary stability and reduce the risk of having a spinning implant because it's not fully tapered. We continue to use buttress thread design. So when we look at dental implant designs, there's obviously multiple types of thread design on the market. And the advantage of a buttress thread design is that it helps to have the flattest part of the thread facing the bone or transmitting the occlusal load. So because the thread, the thread of the implant that is transmitting the occlusal load is flatter, it helps to reduce shear force being placed on the bone. And we know that shear force being placed on bone can increase the likelihood of fractures or micro fractures which may not be such an issue in delayed protocols or delayed load protocols, but especially when you're placing implants immediately, I want to load those implants immediately. You want to minimize the risk of any micro fractures and, and buttress threads definitely help to do that. We continue to manufacture of titanium alloy. BioHorizons has always manufactured of titanium alloy since we began manufacturing and selling implants back in 1997. And really the, the reason for that is because our company was founded by biomedical engineers who came from an orthopedics background. And when you look at what orthopedic companies use, the vast majority of what they create is made out of the titanium alloy simply for strength. So you can see compared to other systems on the market and our competitors in the market, we know it's superior in strength uh, and it helps you be more confident in the longevity or the life of the implant. We've been that confident in the strength of our implants that we've tested our narrowest diameter. So our three millimeter diameter implant against other competitor three millimeter diameter implants. And you can see no matter what the, the cycle or fatigue cycle 
number was, it always took a higher load to fracture the biohorizons implant. The graph here shows orange line for biohorizons, the red line for the Nobel active 3O, the light blue line for dense ply zive, and the dark blue line for the Astro 3O. So again, when you're comparing biohorizons to those competitor 3O systems, it took a higher load to fracture the biohorizons implant. We do have an internal conical hex connection. So we have a conical element on the uh, implant platform as well as the abutment itself. So these two conical parts come together to create a seal. So it's not, a, it's not an old fashioned type butt joint. It is a conical type connection with an internal hex to help stop anti-rotation. And we also have spiral lock thread design inside the implant body. So the female thread is a spiral lock thread design that helps to minimize uh, screw loosening when the implants in function or under occlusal load. So like I mentioned before, we do have three platforms for the Tapered Pro system. Um, yeah. When we're developing implants, we always debate on whether to go for straight simplicity or offer flexibility for the best outcome for the patient. And if it, it's becoming more popular for systems to have maybe just one connection, but the disadvantage of that is it, it becomes a compromise for posterior restorations with a very narrow emergence profile and can also compromise the strength of the connection as well. So here we have three connections across four diameters that give you the ability to have a choice of emergence profile, especially for single units. They're color coded to help make it easy to identify components. So when you look at the platform, the implant, it will be color coded in this case, gray, yellow, or green. And the abutments that fit into the implant platform will be color coded the same as well. Taper Pro is compatible with existing BioHorizons surgical instruments. So if you have BioHorizons tapered kits, the Taper Pro implant system is compatible with those. So whether it's the guided surgery system or the standard surgical kit, it is compatible with both of those. So there's really no need if your existing BioHorizons users, there's no need to get any new instruments. Uh, I simply show this slide um, for our digital workflow partners because when it comes to digital workflows and obviously it's becoming more popular to treatment plan digitally and, and conduct surgery with surgical guides and have re digital restorative uh, workflows as well. We really have an open approach. We work with a wide range of software providers and guide partners and, and restorative software companies as well. So if there's ever, if you're using BioHorizons in a system that doesn't have BioHorizons, it's very easy for us to work with them, but we have a completely open approach to give you flexibility for your uh, treatment planning when you're using digital workflows. The surgical kits themselves are very simply laid out. We, we have a simple color-coded protocol to make it easy as possible to identify the instrumentation for the appropriate implants. And it's simple, top starting in the top left, working through drills incrementally, widening the osteotomy, and then uh, down through the, the color-coded lines for dense bone instruments. And at the bottom, we have color-coded drivers to place the implant. The Taper Pro system does have both a soft and dense bone protocol. Again, because of the more aggressive thread and the heel hook cutting fluid, it's very effective at self-tapping. So you can under-prepare the osteotomy and use the implant to tap itself into the osteotomy. One thing you'll note with Taper Pro, there is no crestal bone drill uh, because of the reduced collar diameter. There's really no need for a countersink or crestal bone or profile drill as it's called in some systems. So it simplifies the protocol. And we, we do not have a bone tap for the system either. We simply recommend that you use the implant as a tap itself. So you can use it to insert it and then reverse the implant if you feel the insertion torque is too high and reinsert it. And again, because of the strength of the material that we use, we're very confident that the implant can withstand the actions of inserting it, reversing it out and reinserting it using the implant itself effectively as a tap. So in S3, 